Live from New York, it's theCUBE. Covering Inforum 2016, brought to you by Infor. Now, here are your hosts, Dave Vellante and George Gilbert. Welcome back everyone, Charles Phillips is here, he's the CEO of Infor. Charles, great to see you again, congratulations. Yeah, thank you, good yeah. to be back. Good. You know, yesterday was so good, the, the keynote, everybody was talking about, <laughs> did you see Charles, he looks so great. You know, <laughs> they were talking about your suit, they were talking about what you said. You know? uh, hopefully what it I just, said, not It just all <laughs> came together. Well, you got their attention and then they yeah. listened to you, right? So, really, it's got to feel great. No, um, no, we're just appreciative. So many people turn out for us and take time out of their summer to come here for a couple days and uh, partners, customers. So the size of this event has been growing every year. It's great for the city. It, it's buzzing as well. We have startups you know, out here on the exhibition floor. And uh, so we're trying to build an ecosystem, not just for Endeavor, but for the whole city. So George, you got to ask you a question. Take us back to mm -hmm. five years ago, six years ago. Oh, huh. the, um, well, I guess I'll, I'll ask it at, at its most blunt. <laughs> when when Infor was a roll up of you know a bunch of different companies and a financial buyer, you know some people thought it was sort of the land of the misfit toys, <laughs> and uh, Santa Claus came in and you know turned it into. Uh, I'm mixing my metaphors here. Yeah. Santa Claus dropped dropped in the chimney and turned it into an enterprise software company that's growing, yeah. you know, very impressively, and even more than just the growth, having all the pieces increasingly fit together. How'd you do it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, I had a great team that came with me. We all joined the same day, in December of 2010. Um, and these were colleagues of mine from Oracle who uh, focused on industry business units and new industries. So I had to pick the right people, number one. You have to have your team. So we joined, and what we saw it in for was through the course of those acquisitions, there were nuggets of specialties of industry expertise. If that's there, and that industry expertise and those customers are still there, we knew we could rewrite the applications, re-innovate, and take the company forward. I loved your, in your keynote, you talked about uh, adjacent innovation, and you gave the example of the Murano glass. Yes. Right, and, and how that led to lenses, which I didn't know, were named after lentils, because they look, you know, That's where the word came from. So, yes. so talk about that a, a little bit, and how it relates to what Infor is doing. Yeah, so we're a complex company, very large, and people uh, kind of wonder, how can you serve so many industries? And it's confusing for people, we understand that, so we're trying to explain that, you know, that's our key strength, the fact that we serve so many industries. Things happen in one industry, in an adjacent industry, it's also applicable. We can see that. So innovations across these different industries, our job is to identify those, repurpose them where it's necessary, and reframe them for that industry. They can't do that. They only see one industry, the customers, and most of the consultants are the same way. We're one of the few companies in the world that are students of multiple industries. We can see things most people can't see, so let's use that as a strength. You know. So, let's talk about your business a little bit. I mean, you're fairly transparent for a private company that's, as Michael Dell says, not on the 90-day shot clock, but you yep. share a lot of financial information. You can we do, we have uh, publicly traded bonds, we report earnings, uh, we have you know, earnings calls, we file SEC filings, so the equity is private, but we run it like a public company. Uh, last quarter we had 35% uh, software growth, uh, year over year, cloud plus licenses, and uh, we've been added, geez, another uh, 700 customers last quarter. So it's all about growth, it's been changing. We now have something like 70 million subscribers in the cloud on Amazon, uh, and that's from almost nothing three years ago. So this has all been a, a new business we created. And, and nearly 100,000 customers now, is that right? Yeah, 90,000 customers and growing, and that's almost uh, twice the size we were when we got here. So five and a half years of growth and investment, spent two and a half billion on R&D, which normally doesn't happen in a private <laughs> company. Uh, but we took the time to rewrite the applications, and that's what we concluded up front. We told the investors when we came in, this is going to take five years, it's going to cost a lot of money, but it can be done. We see some value here, but we need time. And if you're willing to invest, we, we can fix this, you know. So, uh, when you talk about five years time and being able to fix this, I want to contrast this to what I saw at SAP going on in the time I was doing some consulting there, and, and even with Oracle. I remember not long after you started, you said, okay, so customers give us, you know, four years. This was about 2003, and it took both sides really long, uh, much longer than expected. In fact, with SAP, you know, 
between NetWeaver and Business by Design, it was like that John Belushi quote, you know, seven years <laughs> of college down the drain. Yeah. Um, then, but you did something unusual. They did a sort of inside out heart and lung transplant, or so it seemed from the outside on Oracle, right. certainly from SAP. But you talked the other day about the edge, then HCM and CRM, then the sort of ERP finance, and then the industry solutions. Now that struck me as interesting on a couple angles. One, you're doing the things that are more loosely coupled first, and yes. therefore have some give and take. You're, you know, more modular. Um, and that you're modular was critical because you could have separate teams work on separate projects, as long as we have common standards. Right. So you don't have this big monolithic piece of code that you're trying to get thousands of people to work on it at once, and you get a release every five years. That's a hard thing, that's a hard boat to move. And so you left that for last. Yes. But there was also a market advantage to doing it this way. Since the two big guys were doing the heart and lung transplant, you could ring fence their install bases. Yes, and, and sell around it, exactly. Get in where we can fit in, to start selling where we can add value, fill off certain modules, and then start to grow within those customer bases, which is exactly what happened. We'd get in for some specialty function that was industry specific that they didn't have. They'd see how good it was. Okay, let's take two more modules, and then we would just spread out. But it was oh. also convenient yeah. in a way, because you brought in hook and loop, and it's not just, you didn't just wave a wand and all of a sudden your software was beautiful. It's a great tagline, but right. it takes a while to make it beautiful. So you, you were probably still in the process of picking off those, those pieces, is that right? And well, we, uh, you had to make some technology decisions. So the first thing we did was let's uplift the UI, separate that layer to HTML5, and then hand that off to Hook and Loop. So it actually reduced the burden on the core industry developers. Let's take the integration off their hands. Let's take the localizations off their hands. So we actually removed a lot of things they had been doing, because when you're trying to do everything yourself, you do nothing you know, really well. So all they had to do was focus on core industry processes. Almost everything else that surrounds the application, we had a shared service that did that for them. So we had to find a way to get efficient. And then secondly, let's not do things that we can rely on the industry to do. I don't want to build data centers, I don't want to build you know, a lot of other infrastructure. If Amazon can build it for me, I'll use it there. When you were on Wall Street, the technology industry was like this big mystery. Yep. Nobody really understood it. They understood the processes by which, that they wanted to automate. Those right. were really well understood, but the technology was this you know, <laughs> thing that nobody really understood. And you started writing about it talking about databases and other technologies, how it sort of fit, fit together. Today it's almost the opposite. The technology's pretty well understood. You got cloud, you got social, you got mobile, but now with IoT, with, with big data, with digital, you got all these new processes that non-linear consumption, people don't really know what to expect next. So that's, how do you help customers accommodate that? First of all, is that a valid premise? No, that's a great and, description and a great perspective on it. That's the way we view it as well, is that we spent all of this, these years debating the infrastructure, getting that perfect, all these wars that happen. We, that's over, that's going to happen, that's going to get commoditized, that's going to be your service. Hyperscale computer, glass computer, don't worry about the infrastructure. What, do we, what problem are we trying to solve? Why do these industries work? How can you take all this great technology and actually help a non-technology industry improve and go digital? So that's that nexus of technology and business, that's where we sit, that's what we do, is bring those two things together. The technology part has been pretty well solved. That's what we're focusing on the industry. And I can tell you guys are really excited. You know, Benioff was one of the first to say this. There are going to be more SaaS companies that have come out of non-technology companies than technology companies. That's a real tailwind for you, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so if the more people move up and start talking about the application of technology and in industries, the stronger we're going to get. Mm -hmm. At some point, the infrastructure battles get a little bit old and commoditized. Yeah. You know? Talking about that notion of uh, non-tech companies becoming SaaS companies, partially tech companies. Um, the old Saturday Night Live, you know, is it a dessert topping or is it a floor <laughs> wax? You can sell in your industry applications, they can automate some key business processes, but then on top, they can also be a platform as a service, along which on one side, the digital transformation group can help turn it into something that's custom for that customer, differentiated for that customer, and then the, uh, I forgot what you call the business technology office on this side, that's the McKinsey version, right. but the- Hook and Loop Digital, H&L oh, Digital. Yeah, 
but then they can help quantify you know, the business value. Oh, and, and the value engineering group. Value well. engineering. Yeah. And then between the two of them, they can chart a path to help a normal, a normal company become a, essentially have a, have a tech sideline. Is that, that how you see That's exactly it? what customers are looking for us to do. They see all this great technology, they're not sure, okay, how, how does it apply to my business? What should I be doing next? Who's can talk me through that? But I don't want just a generic person talking through that. They have to understand my industry so I know it's relevant, so they can translate it for me. And so we have to have an industry hat and a technology hat on when we go in and right. then be willing to talk that change. And that's why we use the word a lot, assemble. So we have some of it that's custom for that customer, how you assemble technologies for their, to meet their strategy, but we want to reuse a lot of what we've already built. But this is, your, you're pioneering um, something that I, I guess I haven't seen other enterprise technology companies do, which is not only make the platform available, but innovate on the delivery side. Exactly. So that it can talk to the business, business managers who don't speak you know, the technology language. Well, the, the minute I knew we were on to something is when Publicis and McKinsey, those sorts of companies start calling us and saying, what are you guys doing? You're kind of viewing, you guys are kind of popping up as kind of competitors. Are, are you getting into advisory or design and brand? What do you? I said, well, we're kind of doing that, but a lot of what you're doing, we're giving away for free because we want the actual execution and deployment of the technology. So we got pushed further and further upstream because when we started this hook and loop, it was, it was originally about, let me co-design a few screens with you and show you how we can make it beautiful. Then people ask, can you do my website? Well, sure. Well, okay, if I'm going to do your website, what do you want it? Well, you have to help me, let me rethink my brand. Okay, when we think your brand, well, depends on what your strategy is. So now we end up in strategy, we kind of walked up that curve and became strategy people without setting out to do that, but now that we're there, we realize that's a better place to be. And the McKinsey can't do that, and they for can't, that matter, they neither can't can do the back. Yeah, they can't right. go the whole stuff of the way down. Charles, the, the technology business, and specifically the software business, is kind of like the NFL, it's a copycat business, and everybody's got a playbook, and they follow it. You've got a different playbook. You're not going to own your own data centers. You go buy Hook and Loop, you know, a design firm, interesting, several years, four years ago, and nobody was thinking about doing that. Yeah. Um, so, so, somewhat of a non-conventional way of thinking. Oh, my question is around the ecosystem. I would expect at an event like this to hear about developers and the platform and opening up you know, APIs and, and so forth. I hear about Ion and, and Mongoose. Is that part of the strategy or where does that fit? Uh, it is a part of the strategy. Tomorrow's conference, it's a follow-on conference for this, is Partner Day. So we have a whole separate keynote for them. There are people who are extending our platform. They're using Mongoose to develop applications. Two of the acquisitions we've made have been small companies that extended our applications. They were partners at first, implementing our apps, saw, saw a vertical niche, built something, we end up buying them back. So we want partners doing that because it's also a low risk way to buy companies. They've already built it on your platform, sure. you've been co-selling it. And so we have a lot of that going on. It's just in a separate conference tomorrow. So you talk about micro verticals and you invest whatever, $3 billion, which is a lot, but is it fair to say you can't do it all and you're going to look to the ecosystem to do more and more of that or do you want to actually do more of that development and own that? Uh, we can't do it all. Uh, there's thousands of micro verticals. We measure over 2,000 of them. Yeah. And so what we do is encourage these partners to extend our applications in those micro verticals. In fact, we bucket them by vertical, micro vertical. We don't just give you your partner, go do what you want. Here, you're a partner for this vertical, for this geo. And that's the way the partner ecosystem is built 1,500 partners in those micro verticals. And then if something pops up that looks like we can't attract it, we can buy one of them. And the persona of a developer maybe is different in your world. You know, maybe it's not the hoodie. Maybe it is, but there's there are more. Maybe it's more of a business line. Is uh, that? Uh, we, we need people like us who wear a hoodie some days of the week and a suit some of the days yeah. of the week <laughs> that see both sides of it, that enjoy applying the technology and not just dreaming up uh, a widget. You know, we need someone who cares about the outcome. Follow on question on um, sort of, I guess back to the dessert topping, uh, you know, floor wax idea. Um, <laughs> he has the greatest analogy. Yeah, I don't know, where's <laughs> this stuff come from? I don't know, how do you do that? Really gets into <laughs> movies. <laughs> <laughs> don't get me started on stripes. <laughs> um, we got the peanut gallery in on that one. Um, you remember the age old um, I2 versus SAP, and, and then when 
um, IT made SAP a mortal enemy when, when they told TI, you know, implement us first. You don't really need the transactional you know, underpinning. It seems now with retail um, and Predictix and I guess some of the other tuck-ins around them, that you can turn whatever operational data um, they have and operational applications into something very uh, effective in terms of um, making better decisions without doing the transactional renovation. Is that something to be generalized? Whether or not it's Predictix, are mm. we entering an age where we do the analytics first? Um, we use the term outside in, so sometimes that's the better approach. Deliver a value quickly on the pain point that they have today, and the analytics often address that. The same thing for the UI, you know, right? So if they don't like the app, it's not usable, they can't consume it, we can do a quick fix on that. Same thing around CX, the website, facing customers, and then the analytics. Those things have a lot of value. If we do those things well, we usually get the transaction system anyway, because they want it all integrated, because we've, we've added so much value, let's go, let's do the whole full suite. Our largest deals are, start that way, where we start around the edges, and then over time we grow, and they see the value, they give us the entire cloud suite. Can any of the competitors offer that same sequence and value delivery? They tend to be weak because they started in the core, on just core ERP and usually financials. They get weaker as they go out at the edges, and those things are more unique by industry and don't scale as well, so they're less interested in those. We like the fact that it's hard and it doesn't scale across all industry and it's niche, you have to know the industry. That's all the stuff that we do, This right? is really asymmetric competition. We, yeah, we flip the model. Yeah. So all the stuff that people normally don't want to do and they let consultants do, we want to put that in the product. Wow. So what does that mean for the future of the software industry? I mean, you have a really interesting background. You got military background, so you've proven you've got an execution ethos, you've you know, been on Wall Street, so clearly financial, but also you did a lot of writing. When you write, you think, you know, and you accurately predicted, and, and, and then actually went to Oracle and executed on that, that many parts of that prediction. And now you're basically, if I understand it correctly, you're betting that the, the world, your customers are becoming technology companies, software companies, so what does that mean for the future of the business as you see it? I think there are only a few companies in the world that can you know, kind of do what we and Oracle and SAP do, and the, the number of new entrants takes a long time to build a business application. So we have a tremendous opportunity to not only build on what we have, but that multi-enterprise view, which none of the other guys really have yet, at least not for direct goods, that's, if, if, that, if we're right on that bet, that you know, we need to automate the interactions between companies, that changes the entire industry completely, and we're well ahead of anybody else in doing that, and we know where the bodies are buried, what other companies we can buy, how the logistics ecosystem works, the ocean carriers all know us now, the 3PLs all know us now, so that whole world of how do you actually move goods in the, the tariff supply chain, we're the only ones doing that right now. And so if we can get that working, that will solve a lot of issues going forward. Um, would would the sort of would you be working again from the edge inwards on those? Uh, that's what happens. So in that world, the, the ERP in, in, in that world is almost a bookkeeping system. That's, the, that's what happens at the end of the day once all the action is done. Oh yeah, let me update the ERP systems. During the day, the transactions are going, decisions are getting made, orders are getting changed, things are getting rerouted. ERP doesn't even know about any of that. So we know that, that that world is the, actually the live world and trying to do that. And we can take that to other industries. The uh, day we announced the GT Nexus transaction that evening, I had dinner with one of the largest aerospace companies in the world, whose name you would know, a Fortune kind of 10 type company. CFO tells me, I understand what you just announced. The biggest problem we have is it takes us nine months to do a change order on a plane. Why is it? Because I have 300,000 suppliers I can't communicate the change order to and get it confirmed. So it, I, we're doing that manually. Could you do that for me? I think we can do that. Whole Foods, you know, I forgot to mention on stage, we announced the, that acquisition. He calls me and goes, is that what I think it is? I go, yeah. He says, I have 100,000 suppliers. The way we get paid and we differentiate ourselves is to prove that we have organic produce, that we're different from everybody else. Could I put my suppliers on there and validate that with video and a country of Oregon certification and show where the food is being grown and certify something about that farmer? Absolutely. So every industry starts to think like that because everybody has an ecosystem, but they're not on any network. The, the timing of, um, sort of switching topics to New York, the timing of your 
moved to moving in Florida, New York City, um, was quite interesting. A big developer community growing, a huge talent pool. Silicon Valley's unique vortex. Uh, I live in Boston. I saw what happened to Boston, you know, trying to compete with Silicon Valley. New York has found a way to do that. Um, talk about New York, why it's important, and yeah, that was a big decision to move the, the company. The entire, our entire board is still in California, so uh, they didn't quite <laughs> get the reason to be doing it. Go ahead, it. Charles, you go ahead. Initially, <laughs> yeah, uh, but now they love it, and the reasons are, there's several reasons. Number one, we build applications. When you build an application, you need to meet with customers, understand their business process. The customers are here. They all come here for some reason, or they're based here. Uh, it's easier for them to get here than to get to the West Coast. So you see a lot more customers versus engineers, mm -hmm. which is what you have in Silicon Valley, which is great, but it's a different thing. And that's okay for infrastructure. The second thing is all the design talent we were looking for, kind of the people who came to New York to do something in design, whether it's the fashion schools, or architectural schools, or media companies, those schools are here, and they all have tech tracks now. So we hire them directly out of those design schools once they've been trained in a little bit of software, and we can teach them the rest of the software side of it, but you want somebody with that eye for beauty. And it opened up a lot of more hiring for us. No, you know, no one's here but us, and we're building the ecosystem, no one large. We can hire from Europe, we can move people here, we can hire from Israel. They don't mind moving here, this is close enough and familiar to them, they don't want to move all the way to California. So all these different things that we're seeing, and all the universities here are all over us because we, we're the ones who are willing to invest here. Uh, we have multiple universities, you saw one on stage, a couple on stage this morning, who are building curriculum around us. The kids are getting trained in our technology, we're giving them our software, we're training professors, and when they graduate, we'll guarantee them a job with us or one of our partners. Well that, that initiative is amazing to me, right? Because you don't usually think of, you think of, Apple giving computers to schools, not you know ERP companies, yeah. right? but it's become a really But they want jobs because they're getting <laughs> trained in gen just generic stuff and they can't get jobs when they graduate. So now they realize, okay, give, give me a skill set. So the alternative is they graduate, then they come ask me for a job and I have to train them for a year. Uh, I'd let the universities train them. <laughs> a lot cheaper for me. Yeah, you, <laughs> yeah. you were profiled in, in Fortune Magazine, I think, talking about uh, diversity in tech. Yeah. What's the, give us the bumper sticker on that. Uh, I think we're much further ahead at our company than most companies. Partly it's where we're located, partly it's, it's an effort. So we hire a lot of veterans, have a veterans hiring program as well. Uh, we also uh, have a, when we do these uh, internship programs with these universities, we're going to different universities. Everybody goes to the same 10 universities. We're not, we're going to Cooney, we're going to Pace, places that tech companies don't recruit from. They have good students too. And then we take them and we place them in the businesses at our co corporate cost. So you're getting an intern, they always, if it's free, they'll take it. And it just happen to be a little more diverse than you're used to because we get to pick. So that's the way you seed it, is start sending them interns once they see and then they want to hire them when they graduate. I don't know if you're, you golf? I don't know if you're a golfer. But if, I'm not, if you no had, time. So, <laughs> I, I am, but I'm a bad one. But so if you had a mulligan, right, <laughs> if you go back five years, anything you'd do differently? You know, anything you wish you'd? Uh, we've had a, ton of success and have been a lot of fun. Uh, it's always a challenge. You already run into things as you're going along and you had a few few bad hires on people here and there and then you just reset, okay, that didn't work and you find the right, it's all about the right talent though. Mm -hmm. But now the team is there. Certainly the core team that we brought here is everybody's still here, but then you have to build a big team. We've hired something like 5,000 new people in the last four years. So you're going to make a few mistakes along the way. You having fun? Uh, we're, we're having a ton of fun and uh, we just, we think we're changing the world and and uh, the, uh, the brand, without much advertising, has been improving dramatically. We're going to start doing some of that. And people are calling us. We have the, the mayor here, the NYPD commissioner here. They're all coming by to see us. Uh, you know, White House is calling us, asking how we're creating this job. They heard about the internship program. So we're doing things that the other companies aren't doing, at, and we're doing it at scale. Well, we were talking to Duncan. I mean, you guys went through several years of heavy lift. Yep. And it now feels like you're over that hump, and there's a real tailwind. Yep. And now it's time to get the story out in a, in a bigger way, which is obviously this is part of what Inforum is about. And we um, get a two for it, not only growing a company, but if we can put New York on the map technology-wise and the ecosystem here and help a lot of other people who normally don't have access to technology, we can do other things beyond just help Infor. So put the bumper sticker, Charles, on Inforum 2016 as the trucks are pulling away from the Javits <laughs> Center. What should people know about Inforum 2016? Uh, tons of innovation. Our customers loved it and they've been telling us that and the idea that we can do things that are unique and different by industry. 
uh, we think we made some bets and they're turning out to be pretty right and we'll see what happens. Well, congratulations on you know, your progress thus far. You're never done in, in this business, but it's been really fun to watch your career and watch you know, what you and your team have done with Infor, so. Well, thank you guys and thank all the employees and the customers and the customers have been great. You know, when we got here, uh, they hadn't had a lot of new technologies. We told them to wait, we're going to deliver some stuff when they waited and uh, now they're getting it. Well, we appreciate the, the great set here at, at Inforum and uh, the awesome guests, so thanks again for coming on theCUBE. All right guys, good to see you again, man. <laughs> All right, keep it right there, everybody. We'll be back with our next guest. Right after this, I'm Dave Vellante with George Gilbert. This is Silicon Angles, theCUBE. We'll be right back. I'm the Chief Financial Officer for